Welcome to Women Over 70's monthly programming. Today, we bring you Deep Talk Forum, sponsored by Aging Reimagined Circle, a sustaining membership fund. We couldn't do these programs without our members, and we thank you all. In 2019, Catherine and I co-founded the weekly podcast, Women Over 70 Aging Reimagined, because women over 70 are a force. The stories these women share inspire and give hope to future generations of women as we change the conversation about aging. What started out as a podcast only has become a community that educates and empowers women of all ages. So please visit womenover70.com to learn more. And now, here's Catherine. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, <clears throat> we're gathered today because of the Dobbs decision to overturn Roe after 50 years of what most of us thought would be lifetime freedom for women's reproductive rights. <clears throat> and we're honored to, today to have with us three of the original Janes from the Janes Collective, as well as an advocate in the medical field. So you'll be meeting them in just a moment. Let me just say a few things about the format. Um, Basically, it's a program in three parts. So the first part is to hear historical perspectives uh, from, from members of the Janes Collective, the, the then part of the program, pre-1973. The second part is to hear again from the, all of our panel members, kind of their realistic appraisals of what's happening in the post row era, 2022 and forward. And then extremely important is to be talking about strategies for how to reclaim women's right to choose. So, you know, I, I would assume that many, if not all of us feel outrage and despair over this great social tragedy. Yet with activists such as the women on our panel today, there's, there is hope for living once again in a pro-choice world. So let me introduce our panel. We have Heather Booth. Heather, please, there she is. Heather, and I'm just going to make these introductions very short because you're, you'll be hearing from them uh, in, in greater depth during the conversation. Heather, as I'm sure all of you know, is the founder of the, the Janes Collective as she was 19 years old. She's also founder in the early 1970s of the Midwest Academy. Of, it's a national training institute for community organizing. She lives in Washington, D.C. for quite a long time now, where she continues to shake things up. and. Um, then we have the Reverend Dr. Patricia Novick. Where are you? Oh, there she is. Um, <clears throat> we will refer to as Patty. She's an original Jane, a longtime activist in civil rights, women's rights, labor rights, all rights. And then Martha Scott. Where are you, Martha? Okay. Martha is also an original Jane. She was one of one of the seven Janes who were arrested in 1972. And I, I think that's correct. And I learned this morning that she has probably one of the longer, longest time involvement with the Janes, maybe along with Patty. And then we have Nikki Zeit, uh, MD, specializing in OBGYN. She's from, with the um, University of Tennessee Health Science Center. She's an activist in contraceptive equality. And she takes the daily pulse on what's going on in Tennessee and, and around the country. Um, and we were, we, were hope, we were planning to have another Jane, uh, original Jane, Eleanor Oliver. She, uh, because of family reasons, she's not able to join us today and she sends her, her deep regrets. But I, she did send a, a very lovely and heartfelt email to us. I just wanted to read a little bit so that, I guess I think she sets the stage well for our, what we're talking about today. She says, I was in the first group of women who met regularly to divide the week's telephone requests, counsel those seeking service, and guide them through their final appointment with the person providing the procedure. Mm -hmm. Then she and her husband actually left Chicago in 1972 on the very day that the seven women were arrested. And she says, she goes on to say, um, the group I left behind achieved a closeness and sat and cohesion and a sisterhood that was just beginning to develop when I left. When the service began taking control, quote, of the means of production, as the Bolsheviks called it, it became the group 
Laura Kaplan immortalized in her book, The Story of Jane, and more recently, the film, The Janes by Emma and Tia. So we, we will feel that Eleanor is still is part of us today. And um, I have a couple of other things I'm going to read from her a little bit later. So um, thank you again, everyone, for being with us. We're delighted to, to have you. And I we want to begin by giving you a brief overview of the Janes Collective. We're going to ask Heather and Martha to, to provide that for us. And Heather, let's start with you. First, I, I actually want to start with all of you who are listening in and those who will be hearing this uh, on the podcast as it goes on. Uh, women over 70, we are a powerhouse. Uh, <laughs> many of us helped to make change before. We can do it again. When we organize, when we come together, when we use our experience, our commitment, our values-based uh, direction, we have changed this world and we can change this world. So thanks so much, uh, Catherine and Gail, uh, for giving us this opportunity to talk about this piece of history. For um, what Jane was overall is it started as a as a service to help women in need and to some extent to build what we called in the civil rights movement a beloved community to support women who were making amongst the most intimate decision of our lives about when or whether or with whom we have a child and we're seeking an abortion when even three people talking about having an abortion was a conspiracy to commit a felony. And that was in Illinois, but it was true in most of the country. And so for people who had means and resources, who had wealth and family connections, there often were ways that they could find um, an escape and could find an abortion. But for those who did not have money, who did not have family connections, who did not have uh, the knowledge about what to do. It was a frightening uh, situation. It led many women to do damage to themselves or to seek out people because it wasn't legal who did damage to them. And so Jane became a service that started with counseling and then ended up providing the procedures where the women of Jane performed over 11,000 abortions before Roe. You have there. Martha, <clears throat> oh, there you are. I keep looking for you. Martha, okay. if you could talk a bit about the overall structure of the Janes and, and um, how it operated. Okay. Uh, I think Heather is absolutely right that it started out as a kind of, when you think about it, because uh, I think about it in terms of two of the very strongest personalities who were there, one of them being Ruth Sergal, who was a social worker. And when she was, when she joined this group at the time when uh, Eleanor and Heather kind of put the, put the group together, she, uh, the feeling was we can do this social work thing. We can uh, help people in this hard time. And at the same time, we can do the other side of it, which is to provide the uh, the procedure that's needed. Now, at that time, when it first started, uh, the procedure that was needed was not done by the women. Uh, what we, what the group did was uh, uh, respond to people who needed abortions, uh, counsel them, and walk them through the situation and assure them that, first, what they were doing was their choice, and second, what they were doing was safe because we had, we had vetted out the people we had vetted the people who were going to uh, perform these abortions. So um, uh, Eleanor referred to it uh, kind of a little bit in her thing, which is the way it worked is if someone needed an abortion, and it was so much word of mouth. And I just think of Heather's experience when she talks about it, how how it began. You know, uh, she said yes at one time to someone who needed an abortion, and she helped find it. And then somebody else called, and then somebody else called, and then somebody else called. And it all was far too much for a single person. Uh, and so what we did is we set up a, um, a phone line whereby someone would call in and say, say uh, give their name and their phone number. And that's all. 
and they would get a call back. And they knew about this either from friends or we did advertise a little bit in, um, in university uh, um, university newspapers or in the free presses that were around. I mean, this was a time when there was a lot of stuff going on, you know. So anyhow, uh, someone, th they would call back, they would get a call back from a Jane and that person would say to them, when was your last period? Can you talk to a counselor about it and set it up? Uh, and as a group, what we did is every week we would meet and there were this, these cards that were passed around with the information. And we would say, oh, I can take this person. I can talk to her on Tuesday night. I can take that person. You know? So the structure was, was pretty loose when I think about it, <laughs> uh, which is a kind of uh, no surprise. I mean, we came into this, all of us, with not much experience, but somehow it worked. Uh, and uh, we started out, as I say, providing the information and hoping that it would also serve as an empowerment for the people who went through. And little by little, got to know more about it, got to know what the procedure was like, got to know uh, where you where you bought uh, medications, uh, and then eventually how to do it. And the how to do it is what I think makes this particular group, the Abortion Counseling Service, really special a little uh, a little different than other supportive groups. And there were lots of them. Even in Chicago, there was a, a big group called the Clergy Consultation Service, which uh, helped lots of women get abortions. I was just going to ask quickly, what at what point, what, when did you start providing the abort yourselves, providing the abortions? Um, I don't know. In terms of timing? Yeah. yeah. I, I think it was uh, like a year and a half or so into the formation of the group. Okay, thank yeah. you. Okay, we're so interested in learning more about each of you to, to I mean, what what made you participate? And, and, and you said a little bit about the role you played, but you know, what, what stood out for you about the Janes and, and what they accomplished? And, and uh, Patty, maybe, maybe you could start with this part. You're on mute. Um, is that um, each of us has a very individual story. Um, and so as I'm speaking about my experience, it's really my experience, right? Mm -hmm. And to clarify that each one of us has a slightly different perspective. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, I was a community activist. Um, yes, I was uh, 19 years old, but my focus was not so much on the social work but on the social change aspect of the work. And that when we, or when I was counseling, I focused very strongly on this is your de decision. This is your choice. This is your empowerment. And I saw my role with the individual to support them in their own sense of efficacy. I saw myself less of a social service provider than I did see myself as supporting people in terms of their efficacy, their choice, their decision. And that made a big difference for me. Um, I think the other thing that um, was particularly true of all the Janes is how hardworking, you know, people committed to do this because they believed in it. They spent time, energy, effort. And I, I hadn't seen these women in 50 years at the time of the Jane film. And there they were, people who were committed to working hard, to making decisions, to being available, and are still still communicating. It's a particular quality of being that I felt of it when the film came out, very proud to be a member of this group. It mattered to me because of who these people were. Um, my own uh, approach, uh, I was recruited to Jane by Susie Schwerin, who was, um, you know, sort of a, a kind of middle class uh, woman uh, with um, a very sort of traditional life, but she was committed to the issue, and she cared about it. And the whole idea of rights of the individual were important to her. And she recruited me uh, into Jane to support her, and I was part of that early group of meeting, you know, and getting people to, um, who I would get to consult. 
So mind, that was important for me. Do you mind telling us, Patty, where you were at the time when you were recruited? What what were you doing in your life at that time? Sure. Um, um, well, um, Heather and I were quite close. I, I don't think we were living, we, living in the same house. We weren't living in the same house as yet, but um, we're close and we're close with our husbands. Um, at that time, point in my life. Um, I was married. Um, my husband, um, my first husband is deceased, but Al was a leader of the Chicago Civil Rights Movement. He brought Dr. Martin Luther King to Chicago. Um, I was on the Northern staff of LC, SELC. I have a sweatshirt which says SELC staff, which is Martin's organization, and was involved directly uh, actively in the civil rights effort. So the notion of rights um, for everyone, I mean, it's really the conversation about individual rights. I think it's the issue of the civil war, right? State rights versus a larger view of how we talk about humanity. So those were my values then, that was my work then, and my work today is very similar. Thank you so much. And and Martha, how about you? Where where were you at the time when you were recruited? Well, where I was at the time was uh, in a community that had a sense of uh, real activism. We lived in Hyde Park and there was a lot going on. Certainly um, everyone, you know, participated in the marches against the war and the civil rights marches. And I was a stay-at-home mom with four kids and uh, a friend of mine uh, from the playground Say it home, mom with three kids said, you know, I do this thing, which is really kind of interesting. And it has uh, it has all of the earmarks of both activism and help. Mm -hmm. And uh, it doesn't take very much time, maybe, you know, a couple of hours of an evening. I mean, really, she didn't know what she was saying in that regard, since both of us managed to get drawn into the part where, uh, to the point we were very, very involved. And so I started out doing that, taking a counselee once a, once a week uh, or twice a week in the evening when my kids were already asleep and uh, spending time with them. And then little, little by little got drawn in. Uh, I don't think that, uh, no, I don't want to say it that way. I mean, it was in fact a political education for me. Yeah. I mean, not only for the women coming through, where we hoped it would be a, a political moment, they, where they would say, oh, this is something I could choose for myself that maybe the world doesn't want me to do. But for me, it was also a political education about how um, uh, group effort can make changes, how you can actually do something. Um, and even if it is at some risk to yourself, it is worth doing. Right. Kind of that's where I was. Thank you. Yes, yes. And and Heather, what about you? For me, in many ways, it actually started in the civil rights movement. I have been part of the northern part of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the youth arm of the civil rights movement, and went to Mississippi in 1964. Some of you may remember there was the Freedom Summer Project. And it gained notoriety as northern students were uh, there to help very courageous African Americans in the South, in Mississippi, who were risking their lives and livelihoods in order to register to vote. And the summer project gained notoriety when three of the young volunteers, Andrew Goodman, James Cheney, and Michael Schwerner, were killed at the hands of the Klan. Mm -hmm. But within a year, we won a Voting Rights Act. And the key lesson that I learned from it was that when you organize, when you take action together, you can change this world, mm -hmm. but you have to take action. I also learned you have to stand up to illegitimate authority sometimes. Um, I had been demonstrating, I simply was holding a sign in Mississippi um, saying freedom now, and I was arrested. I was 18 years old, completely frightened. But I learned you have to stand up to illegitimate authority to follow your moral values sometimes. But that was a backdrop to then what happened when I returned to campus in 1965. A friend of mine told me his sister was pregnant, nearly suicidal, and not ready to have a child. And could I help 
her find someone to perform an abortion. And though I didn't have any idea about it at all, for those of us of our generation may remember, we barely talked about sex with other people, let alone talked about abortion. But I went to the medical arm of the civil rights movement, uh, Medical Committee for Human Rights. And some may know uh, Quentin Young was the head of it in Chicago. Uh, some may remember, remember him, quite a remarkable leader. And he directed me to a a uh, physician, Dr. T.R.M. Howard, and I didn't know it at the time, but he had set up Friendship Clinic on 63rd Street, a women's clinic. Hmm. And the procedure was successful. And then Justice Martha said, I actually thought that would be one off. I thought I would do it once and that would be it. <laughs> but word spread, someone else called, spread again, someone else called, as I kept making the arrangements I then asked a Dr. Howard for what was involved. What do you do before? What do you do after? How do you take care of the women in building what in the civil rights movement we called a beloved community? And then I'll just the last section on that is that at, um, Dr. Howard then was out of contact with us. And I think he was probably arrested for providing abortions, though he didn't turn didn't turn me in. Um, and I made contact with someone else. And I believe that that was Mike. And that uh, who we made the same arrangement that we made that I had with Dr. Howard. And as the more and more women were coming through, just as Martha said, it was, I needed to recruit others to do the work. I couldn't manage it. And so I recruited others. We met at Eleanor Oliver's house. And that led to the further creation of first what we call the service, a counseling service. And then over time became the uh, arena for doing the procedures. Mm. Wow. Um, I, I just know. wanted to say something about Dr. Quentin Young. Um, the townhouse where I lived, uh, Dr. Quentin Young was just a few feet away. And then across the street in the high rise was the uh, comedian Dick Gregory. And we had uh, the police coverage for all three of us so that the presence of the police around the activities of civil rights activists during that time, I think is an important thing to be aware of. Uh, Al and I, my husband and I, had permanent police tales for a very long time. Hmm. Yeah, Catherine. Can I add uh, look, something from Eleanor. Sure. Because she um, she says I can. This is from her email again. I cannot talk about the phenomenal group that's stimulating all this interest half a century later, but perhaps I could warn against becoming a myth. Already, the service is becoming a plot line in movies and TV mm -hmm. shows. She said, I've given a few interviews and she names places. And she said, they asked me some far out questions. I try to bring them back to earth with my basic realistic answers. The only outrageous aspect of our, about our group was that women were being denied a basic medical service that should have been part of every OBGYN practice, but was not. So the Chicago Women's Liberation Abortion Counseling Service began providing it. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, people have any uh, questions or comments you want to put in the chat room? We'd be happy to hear them. Have, take a look at those. Uh, there, there is one question. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Is that, is that worth addressing? It was just a direct message. Oh, okay. Uh, we're partner supportive of the work. It's an interesting question uh, that Susan Joe Stahl has raised. Um, initially, I started doing this before I was married. I, I got married in 1967, uh, found, met my husband at a sit-in in 1966. Um, but mm -hmm. so this was before I had a partner. It also was, we knew it wasn't legal. And so I wasn't discussing it with anyone. <laughs> so initially there wasn't <clears throat> someone else, but my husband was uh, supportive of it. But in a funny way, 
it was a side thing that was happening initially. It wasn't seen as the real political work, uh, partly because it wasn't a public organization, because it wasn't legal. But over time, uh, my husband, Paul Booth, who was also a leader of the student and anti-war movement, he was supportive of it. And Pat has mentioned that later she and her husband, me and my husband, we all lived in the same apartment, both for protection, for lower cost, potentially to raise our kids together. And there also was one police car that could be outside. Right. And we right. used to say the one police car got four people for the price of one. <laughs> so they were it, they were supportive. Yeah, I, I want to say a little more about that because Martha and I talked about this during our breakfast. Um, um, my husband uh, took a brown bag up and down 53rd Street and in various taverns and restaurants, collected cash. Um, my, uh, my, my best friend, Jean Hunt, her husband, Lester, also carried a brown bag and went and collected money and got cash. Um, uh, Jody's husband, as you know, uh, supported in all kinds of ways. So my, my view of the help and support of our husbands, spouses, lovers was really important. Eleanor's husband, Len, in the beginning was skeptical. But he changed his view over time, and uh, he would he drove me on three occasions over to Jody with money for to purchase materials. So overall, my experience was that our husbands were and lovers were not only supportive but were right there with us. I had breakfast with Martha, and Martha said, "Martha, do you want to say what you said to me?" Which was, "Yes, there were people who were not supportive." Because that was not my experience. Yeah, I wanted to mention that that uh, my own experience was was very supportive. My uh, my husband, I think, uh, said, "Well, you want to do it? Just go and do it. It's going to be fine. You know, whatever." Uh, uh, and when, in fact, when I was uh, uh, arrested, he was, you know, he was. Um, I, mean, I don't even say he was irritated. It was uh, this is something that might have happened, and we're gonna we're gonna go. Through through it. But this was not true for everybody in the group. First of all, there were a fair number of people in the group who were singles, had not yet moved into a situation where they had the support of a, uh, of a partner. And then there were people for whom this was the beginning of them saying, I'm in a relationship that will not, will not be sustained. These are, these are, uh, these are uh, people, I, this is a person I am with who doesn't understand the importance of this and maybe doesn't understand the importance of me. So it was not, it was a, it was a mixed bag. And it was kind of interesting to see the, those women who were our friends who would say, you know, uh, my relationship is falling apart, but we were there. And that was in lots of ways, very helpful. It's, it's not like people cheered, but they did say, you know, life can be better than, than what you've been given from with this guy, that kind of thing. And so, as I said, there was some of each. Uh, I, I personally feel real uh, happy. Uh, I, fe I felt very lucky to have a lot of support, not only um, from my husband, but also from my extended family, who said, you know, go, go for it. Go and do it. Wow. You know, I, I, wanted to, to, I wanted to emphasize something that Martha was saying and also implied, and that the women on the call will know because we are over 70 and <laughs> we're around in that era. But it, it is hard for younger people now to realize what it meant when women were not an equal part of the society. We're still not equal. There's a long way to go. But we are not where we were. Women in a group, uh, first of all, many in the movement saw it as a men's movement. Uh, who were the... You know, in the civil rights movement, part of it was out of the church, which was a men's hierarchy. Uh, part of uh, the student movement was focused on the draft. So it was a men's focus. And women's role were often the uh, clerical secretaries, often doing the work, uh, getting the coffee. <laughs> and so 
Um, and even in the medical profession, women weren't doctors. And uh, in fact, there was a uh, there was a, a riddle that I often used to start talks with. I'll, I'll end with this, um, but it just shows what the what the times were like. Here's the riddle. A father and son are traveling down a road. There's a terrible accident. The father is killed. The son is taken to an emergency room. The surgeon comes in, looks down at the boy and says, oh my God, that's my son. And the question I'd ask the group who knew I was speaking about women's liberation was how could that be? And the answer, even in a group of say a thousand people was, oh, <coughs> there was a transmigration of souls. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, the the surgeon is also a priest, so everyone's the surgeon's son. But the answer is the surgeon's a woman. But it wasn't true then. And so what Martha's talking about, what Pat's talking about, and what Nikki now is involved in is partly so, it's such a different world because a women's movement has made it possible for women to find our voice, find our positions, find our ability to care uh, for others as we wish. Yeah. A so, little yeah. comment on this about how there, there were no women doctors. The, as, a, uh, as a particular uh, set of doctors, there were practically no women OBGYNs, which mm -hmm. every time you think about it, doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, and it uh, this was, you know, by deliberate design from uh, the, the medical, uh, from the medical world. So that, uh, you're absolutely right, absolutely right, Heather, that has changed. It used to be this, if you were a doctor and you were a woman, you were a pediatrician, that was allowed. But certainly you didn't get to be a surgeon or, or, a, or a gynecologist, really. That was for the, that was big bucks. That fits right into a question that uh, Ricky McKenna asked. And she says she's in awe of the Janes and curious as to how the women took over and performed the procedures as uh, as you as Heather mentioned in her article in here. And so she also says, thank you all for, for what you've done and being here now. But who wants to answer that? How is it that you took over the procedures? A person recently said to me, that you know, in, in uh, sometimes in the medical world, it's uh, uh, see one, do one, teach one. Which, when she said that to me, I thought that is not how they teach doctors, is it? But in some ways, that is kind of how we taught one another. It was uh, a lot of observation, and then uh, little by little, uh, the group itself got more involved in the actual procedures itself. So that when a woman came to have an abortion, uh, we said we would like to have one of our people there to sit with her to make sure that uh, she's comforted. And, and so from that angle, uh, there was a woman in the room with someone who was having the procedure done. And very, very often that was a woman, that was this woman, Jody Parsons, who uh, was uh, part of the original group, who was watching it go on. And with one of the abortionists, who really wanted to get out of the business, he and Jody kind of had a mutual interest in her learning to do it. I think she may have had more interest in learning to do it than he had uh, interest in teaching her, but she pushed. And so little by little, she learned. She learned uh, kind of the kind of basic things that you learn when you go, when you would go to a gynecologist, how to put the speculum in and, uh, you know, citing the cervix and uh, using, uh, uh, using appropriate uh, medications to uh, make it possible. And so little by little, she learned to do it. And once she was a competent abortionist, she said, I can do this and lots of other people in our group can do it. <laughs> because it's a very narrow, what's interesting to me is that at least at the time we were doing DNCs and eventually then we were doing vacuum aspirations. This is a very narrow set of information. And uh, it's not like, you have to know a whole lot about anatomy. Uh, and I, not, I, I often think that we knew what we were doing very, very well, but it was really little, not at all what, a, what an OBGYN actually knows and not at all what uh, a, 
a real practitioner of other kind of medicine knows. But that's okay, because what we were doing was servicing people who needed this one thing. I thought it was it. Little by little, we all, you know, many of us learned, and it was a useful thing to have learned in that way, in this basically apprenticeship system. Thank you. Let's move into the now, the now part of the program. And the, um, I'm inter- we're interested in, uh, for each of you, it played a different role during the, during the, the Jane's Collective, and now many of you are reuniting after 50 years. How are you working together as a, as a group? Patty, do you want to start? Yeah, um, again, my role is in some ways particular as a member of the clergy. I'm an ordained United Church of Christ minister, and I was contacted by um, someone who was a year behind me in my seminary and two who were a year ahead of me, and um, I have been contacted by 10, at this point, I guess 12 women clergy from around the country, four of them in Texas who are working with community-based organizations and participants in their churches who want ideas and have their own about what to do next and how they can support through their churches, through their congregations. Um, I have recently been contacted by uh, two Catholic priests who I know who think it's important to take a position on this issue. And um, I come out of Trinity uh, United Church of Christ, which was Obama's church, and Reverend Moss, uh, who is my, uh, that's not the church I serve, that's my home church, uh, takes a very strong position within the Black community on that this is an issue of state rights. This is a Black voting rights issue. This is an issue um, not of um, just abortion, but of the issue of rights and that this is what he's really talking about is the civil war. And so within my cluster, within my congregation, we're now meeting to discuss these issues and how we're carrying it into our churches, into our sermons and into our organizing. Anyone else want to speak to that? Martha, you, I think you've continued to be involved it, over time. Yeah, it, um, there is a sense of reuniting, but to a great extent, this, this has been driven by this movie that has come out, the documentary, uh, the documentary, The Janes, and this unfortunate but ironic timing that it happened exactly at the same point that Dobbs came down. So uh, there is this movie that is being shown in lots of different places. And there is now, of course, an enormous interest in doing something to make things better again. So I, uh, I and many of other people in my in the group uh, get requests for being on panels like this one, or uh, uh, um, also uh, being present at the showing of the movie, so mm-hmm. that there's a Q and A afterwards, so that people can pursue it and pursue it in terms of something that Heather would really appreciate, which is this is activism. You can do right. something now. Yeah. We did that then. Uh, and whatever is going to happen now is going to be different, but it doesn't mean it doesn't take lots of commitment and kind of stepping outside of your comfort zone and saying this is important to do. So I, I look at it less as a reunion, though, of course, that does have that wonderful feel of seeing people I haven't seen in a really long time. And I'm very regretful that Eleanor is not on this Zoom to also be seen. But uh, it's more that this is the time to talk about this right now and do something so we're kind of doing it maybe maybe this gets into oh martha were you saying something else i didn't mean to cut you that this may get into the next section which is right what do we do now yes. but it does matter that we use this moment we're less than a month away from an election, which will matter <laughs> enormously. It's not the only thing that matters, but it matters now. Two more votes in the Senate who are for overturning the filibuster. It's simply a rule, and all you need is a majority vote to overturn the filibuster. And we will codify Roe. It's already been passed in the House. The president has said he would sign it. We just need two more votes in the Senate. And so what you do matters enormously. But we also have to sustain the House. 
to ensure that there are people voting who, where it's only by five votes that we now um, have a majority in the House that has a uh, pro-choice majority. And we can do this, but it matters what we do every day between now and the election. And in Illinois, there's a particular race that matters, and that is the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. There are only, I think it's eight st or nine states. There are only a few states in which the Supreme Court is elected, uh, the members of the Supreme Court, and Illinois is one of them. There are two seats that are open on the Supreme Court that are up for election. And each of them have sort of a MAGA Republican against a, a liberal Democrat. Mm -hmm. And it will matter. And on this issue, it will matter because it is about protecting this most intimate freedom of our lives. And one way to talk about it is, as I said this before, but the freedom to determine when or whether or with whom we have a child. And the overwhelming majority of the population is for it. Nearly 80% of the population believes that a politician should not become between a woman and her physician on making this decision. And so the courts have been in violation of public will, of constitutional precedent, and of fundamental morality and justice. Gail, why don't we move to have to hear from, from Nikki and to bring in the uh, physician's OBGYN point of view? Yeah. Well, we are interested now in the in the um, you know the legal landscape and the women's medical autonomy as you brought out so eloquently, Heather, it stands on the vote in many instances here. And I mean, we are also interested in what are the key legal similarities between then and now, but let's look at now first. And Nikki, please tell us uh, your perspective and being a physician in Tennessee and all the other states you know about. Well, thank you so much for having me. I am also in awe of these women. And while I did take a lot of time and training to learn these skills, I don't disagree with the idea that this particular small niche can be performed by people who are trained in just this skill. Mm -hmm. I firmly believe that all OBGYNs and maybe some other uh, family physicians, emergency room physicians should have this skill and should be providing this. And we shouldn't need lay people to jump in and provide this care because it should be easier to access by everyone. Um, but the history behind the Janes and what you all did is truly amazing. Um, I think there are key differences between pre-Roe and now, one of the biggest being that medication abortion is safer and more accessible. And so the majority of first trimester abortions that occur prior to Dobbs actually were uh, medication abortion instead of procedure abortion. Um, and that was incredibly safe and relatively accessible. Now, of course, in about half the states that's being challenged. Um, and when you ask, you know, Gail about the legal landscape now, it is a daily change. And it is really hard for providers and people needing the care to keep ahead of that. Um, thankfully, we had a couple big wins over the weekend with Arizona and Ohio's cases being enjoined. Um, but there are still cases, you know, currently in the court that on any given day, somebody could decide to overturn a stay and a law could go back into place. The states surrounding Tennessee are in constant flux. So we have resources for our patients who come in needing this care and we have to either update the resources every day or simply tell them to go to abortionfinder.com. Um, and then legally, we worry a little bit about something that was mentioned earlier, the idea of discussing it. If three people discussed abortion in the past, that was a felony. Well, now we don't live in the world of a gag order, but we are always worried that that could come up or the term aiding and abetting could be used by us giving information to someone who goes and gets an abortion out of state. Um, so I am not a lawyer and I don't understand, you know, each state's laws. Um, and 
how somebody may decide to use the law. But currently in Tennessee, we have the worst law in the entire country, which um, has absolutely no exceptions. Um, it, the whole law is only two pages. So if you wanted to go and look it up online, you could easily find it. Um, but instead of exceptions, we have something called the affirmative defense, which means ending any pregnancy as a felony, absolutely a felony. And then if you are charged with that felony, you can defend yourself and try to prove in a jury trial that you performed the abortion because in your good faith medical decision making, it was necessary to save the life or certain organs of the pregnant person. And that's it. The same law was enjoined in Idaho because the Department of Justice realized that that is a major conflict for physicians who have taken an oath and also have to worry about malpractice and emergency medical care. And to be caught between making that decision to emergently take care of a person um, and going to jail is simply not fair and does not provide an environment where taking care of people is possible. Wow. And, and uh, you have some sort of a map, I believe, that shows. What yeah, I don't think I can share it now, but there are lots of them. Oh. Gutmacher.com, um, the Gutmacher organization may be one of the best resources for that. Or even like I mentioned that abortionfinder.org um, uh -huh. uh, because they are keeping up to date with the laws. But the I presented, I've been presenting at um, uh, grand rounds or medical uh, symposiums on this topic. And the map changes from the day of the Dobbs decision to you know four days later when some of our triggers started going into place or laws that were existing went into place. To when you know 30 days later when other triggers went into place a couple of days later when courts started getting involved in it. but it's all different and then you have to have so many different keys because you know some of them are gestational age bans that started at a certain gestational age some of them are total bans some of them have exceptions for the life of the um, woman some of them have exceptions for rape and incest. Some of them have a rape exceptions for fetal anomalies not compatible with life, and some of them don't. So to try and understand all of these laws, really you need an expert in any given state to understand, except for in Tennessee where there just are no exceptions. So that's pretty easy to understand. Wow. By the way, there's some states where even there's a bounty to be paid if you inform on someone else who's preparing to have an abortion. So it's turning us into some kind of authoritarian autocracy, uh, a tyranny where, you know, police state, you inform on your, your mother, your sister, your cousin, your taxi cab driver, yeah. And That's that was the, set at $10,000 in Texas. And then I think it was Oklahoma said, well, no, it should be $100,000. It's so that much as it's state. The, yeah. The, so the idea of the vigilante justice is a tactic of the anti-choice movement, because typically when there's a law in place mm -hmm. and you know who um, enforces the law, you know who to sue to try and stop the law. So in Tennessee, I sued the state of Tennessee when our law went into place um, in the middle of the night attached to the COVID budget, our ban went into place in May of 2020. Uh, and it was a ban that had a cascading gestational age um, and then also some other clauses. And we sued and we were able to get it enjoined or parts of it enjoined but there's nobody to sue in the Texas law. And that was you know, brought to the Supreme Court. And of course, the current Supreme Court let it stand um, and said, well, you can't sue every citizen of uh, Texas that's going to turn in their neighbor. And so the law, there's no way to stop it in the current legal and justice system. So let's bring the conversation. We talked about the, the some of the, the legalities, some of the, what was going on then, um, and several of you have made the alluded that this abortion is not a single issue. It's not a single issue. And so, uh, Nikki, you've been you've actually been talking about that in terms of the the consequences. And you know, going back to 
the Jains first started as a service to those in need, which is how Martha described it. And Carolyn has raised a question about when Roe was um, passed in 1973, what happened? Did, did the Jains Collective, did the counseling service continue? What was, what was the continued need at, um, at that time? Martha? Yeah, I, uh, well, many of us felt as though, let the, uh, let the ordinary medical profession take care of this now. We, we no longer needed to endanger ourselves yeah. like this. There was a small number of people who felt, oh, no, we should continue. We deliver such a better service than they will get other places. <clears throat> and a fair number, not a fair number, but some of our uh, the people who were part of the uh, abortion counseling service then went on to be health providers, nurses. And uh, one, I remember one saying to me, you know, and she worked for Planned Parenthood for a while, and she said, I mean, they're providing an enormous service, but it's not as good as what we did. It's not, it's not as it's it doesn't involve the same sense of we're all in this together. This is a, a, a source of empowerment for you. You are making an important decision and we are here to help you. So there was an interesting thing to think about in a way that we did. We delivered something that was very different because we came from an activist point of view. We came from the point of view that. Uh, both Pat and, and Heather talked a lot about. Uh, some, uh, we tried to stay, what's interesting is just afterwards, we tried to stay involved a little bit. We kind of thought of ourselves as paramedical people. And we set up a, a clinic that did, uh, clinic might be the wrong word, but a, an association where people could come in and we would do pap smears and breast exams and things that were in fact allowed. It wasn't considered that you were practicing medicine but allowed women to have some entry into the uh, medical world that maybe they wouldn't have had otherwise. And a fair number of us uh, then went on to become uh, kind of, I, for want of a better word, sex ed teachers who, you know, took this information and uh, either went into the public schools or uh, talked to other situations where uh, kind of talked about our experience as a way of saying, you know, there's uh you need not be in a in a situation where you don't have control. You can figure out a way to have control, and, and that's very important. I just think of that time, you know, before Roe v. Wade, and how little control women had. Period. Do you know? It's like I mean, the landscape was very weird. I, I just remember the first time I got birth control, I had to pretend to be pregnant. You know, the, the, that kind of, and women really didn't have a lot of. The women were the major the major people who interacted with the medical profession, the medical profession didn't have a whole lot of respect for them. You know, it's kind of, you know, and it's better now, but it's not 100%. The other thing I wanted to say is things are, things have changed a lot because of medical abortions that you can do this with pills. And it's changed a lot because of the internet and social media. Uh, and I just think we have to be very careful if we're thinking about how we're going to use both those two aspects of modern life, especially in places like Tennessee, if people want to find wrongdoers and do it through the internet or through the uh, acquisition of large numbers of pills. I mean, it's just, it's a different landscape and whoever is going to do that kind of activism, which I think is kind of parallel to what the abortion counseling service did, they got to think about those things in a way that it's different, you know. I wanted to raise two other things that I think are quite different. One is that this has become a partisan, weaponized, funded political issue that it was not in 1965 uh, when I started it, or even in 1973. There was a deal made between the extreme, what is now the, the MAGA wing of the Republican Party and the uh, evangelical churches, where there basically was a deal saying uh, the political operation will provide a political apparatus to advance the issues of concern to a specific religious uh, denomination to carry out their specific religious beliefs and provide funding and technical expertise for it, including dark money, where you don't even know where it comes from. Right. And in exchange, the churches would provide the people to provide those votes 
that largely are now the uh, a large base of the support for what becomes the Trump wing of the Republican Party. That is a transformation. And because on the pro-reproductive freedom side, we don't have the same kind of institutional support in the entire progressive movement. Maybe unions were a comparable support, yeah. but they've been decimated and undermined by an opposition. And so the building of organization that can provide that support is one of the most important things we can do. The second thing that's different is I think that we are different. All the women on this call, we are different and our numbers are different magnified. The outpouring that has been uh, in the country since the Supreme Court decision is an indication uh, that even when Roe passed, Roe became the law, there wasn't the outpouring like there is now. And also because this is a taking away of a freedom that we had, there really is a, a vehemence. And whether we can drive that forward to make the difference that we want to see in less than a month, it's up to us. It is up to all of us, not only to say we'll vote, but how many more people will we recruit Will we make the phone calls? Will we do texts? Will we go door to door? Will we do the work? Nikki, I see you have a hand up. Yeah, so I never practiced medicine before Roe. I was born in 72, so don't remember life before Roe. And I have to say that we, my generation, and a lot of physicians took it for granted and did not really give it um, the, the care that it needed to protect the rights because it was taken for granted. And then the group that you speak of marginalized it and siloed it and made it this not true health care. And so abortion care has always been, as long as I've been practicing, something that was not spoken of as true health care, was not humanized as an issue where people should be able to make these decisions without the intrusion of the politicians and the legislators. And then I think it was, um, you know, Martha who spoke earlier and said that in general, this issue is just not talked about enough. And it was allowed to be, you know, taken over by the anti-choice side until the leak. And when the leak happened, people started to say, wow, we may maybe need to get our heads out of the sand that this was a protected right that will stay. And then when the decision came, even more so, people said, this isn't what we wanted. This is something that we allowed to happen because of this dark money and the takeover of the courts and the takeover of the different states. But they have taken a medical decision, a healthcare issue, and made it political. And I don't think that most people want that, but our only way to fight it is to make it political to get people to vote. I just wanted to kind of comment on that because I sometimes think about the abortion issue. It's so it's so visible out there, especially after Dobbs. And, uh, uh, and then I think about kind of how the country is going. Uh, I worry about other things that will ha that uh, that people who have control will will also will also eviscerate. I mean, not only reproductive rights. I mean, just and that's easy to do. You know, you can say that uh, a uh, an IUD is an abortifacient, and therefore you can't do IUDs, and you know, if, depending on where you move. But then also there are other rights that people will will uh, it, they will intrude upon: gay rights and, and disability rights and voting rights. And so I feel as if if we can make a difference, as Heather is talking about. Uh, on the legislative level to uh, do something about this, it's kind of, it'll be kind of a hopeful sign that maybe we can do something uh, to protect those rights also. Mm -hmm. Addie, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I really want to underline what Martha just said. I work with a group of gay men who really see the abortion rights issue as the slippery slope mm -hmm. that is going to impact on them next. Um, I've been meeting with a disability group at um, DePaul University, and they're terrified that the abortion rights issue is going to impact on their issues of disability rights. So again, I, to talk about it 
in terms of individual freedom, autonomy, rights, that that's what's being addressed here. And to, you know, it's not about, um, uh, simply about a medical opportunity. It's about human rights. And it's what I've certainly been working for my whole life. And this is just one <laughs> opportunity, but a significant one to take a stand and make a difference. You know, should we, let's talk more specifically then about, okay, how, how do we organize? How do we make a difference? Where do we put our energies? And because there's so many different areas that we can try to ha- we, we can actually have an impact. I have a, I have a, a way to encapsulate it because you're right, Catherine, so many things are needed. I mean, if you have uh, the arts, if you have a uh, creativity, if you have a podcast, if you have a blog, if you uh, talk to your friends and neighbors. But there's one way that I try to encapsulate it by talking about four M's. We need to ensure that we provide members. We need to recruit people. Are there others of us on on this call who could each recruit two people to work on the election? For those who are up for it, going door to door, most effective way, making phone calls. Uh, There's personal PAC in Illinois. Many of you are from Illinois. Uh, There's Planned Parenthood. There's uh, other organizations you can connect with. So members, we need to recruit people to do the work. Message. We need to say the words, just like this podcast is doing. We have to write the articles. We have to talk to our neighbors. It's one of the reasons I kept repeating about a freedom. We talk about this not as a choice, which sounds superficial, but as a freedom, the most intimate freedom in our life to make the decision about when, whether, or with whom we have a child. So we send that message. We have to raise money and give money. Even now, money can make a difference. And then movement. We have to show up. So there's so many things we can do. It might be legislative. It might be electoral. It might be organizing. It might be cultural. We'll each find a way that we can have an impact. The main thing is that we take the steps together. And when we organize, we can change the world. Yay. Woohoo. So are there questions from the audience now? Yes, and there is one in the chat, let's see. Betty, Betty Rauch, good to see you, Betty. Why do you think that the Democratic Party apparatus has been so quiet about this issue? I actually, that isn't my experience, Betty. My experience is not only is um, the vice president's gone around, I think she's had almost, I don't know, 15 or more events, Uh, just primarily focused on it. I think it is the number one issue that is now in ads on the Democratic side. Uh, In fact, there's uh, some concern that we have to come back and ensure that there's also an economic message uh, about, uh, you know, inflation, about uh, preserving Social Security uh, and other issues. I think there's increasing concern about that. But Betty, my experience yeah, why don't you say more on it? Uh, but well, my experience I, is... I, um, I think maybe living in New York City, we don't hear this because every, you know, I mean, it's New York is New York and they don't need to spend money on us. And so I, I think maybe that my is skewed by living in such a known blue area. I'd also say then you can be involved and I see Terry's hands up, but uh, Betty... You can be involved, connect with the Democratic Party or the candidates that you're that are working on this. It is one of the most potent issues, but also I'd encourage you to help elevate it as an issue. It is, as I said before, it is nearly 80% in the high 70s of the population who think that a politician should not become between a woman and her physician on making this decision. Heather, one of the things that you're saying. Uh, that you've talked about is that this is going this is going to spread. It is not just about abortion. We are on a slippery slope to to Margaret Atwood's vision of of a society, and it's and it is literally happening. That's what's very right. terrifying. 
to me. Yes. I believe that we are on a knife's edge now in a fight between democracy and tyranny, between freedom and an authoritarian rule and the undermining of everything we care about. The freedom of reproductive decision making is a front edge. Pat talked about, um, Patty talked about how next comes uh, marriage equality. Um, But it's also about voting rights. Two more votes in the Senate, and we can also codify the Voting Rights Act, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. That's also passed, but we need two more votes in order to overturn um, the filibuster for that. And once we do that, there are other things that can be done. It's about 80% of the country believe there shouldn't be assault weapons on the street. Assault weapons. And anyway, so many other things are possible, but you are so right, Betty. It matters that we take action now. And one thing about an election is it allows all the issues to come together in addition to any one that might be a cutting edge. Terry, did you have a question? Heather, when I was Terry Weedoff, I came to your training session in 1981. Oh my goodness, I remember you. (laughs) And I had my baby with me. She is now a 41 year old Chicago public Uh school teacher. Um, But, I wanted to say that there is a group organizing suburban women across the, some of the key states, Ohio, Arizona, Michigan, called Red Wine and Blue. And you may know about it. Um, This is a real interesting group to check in with. You can look online for it. It's called Red, W-I-N-E and Blue. Um, And one of the things that they're doing and that all of us can do is think about who we know who live in those places where the vote is critical and make sure that they vote and in our own districts make sure that our friends who may be somewhat distracted by the rest of life remember to vote make sure that they know how early voting works or absentee ballots or whatever so to whatever extent and this is a red, wine, and blue thing. Talk to your friends, even your friends who may be ambivalent about some of these things, and ask them what really matters to them and link that to what we're trying to do. So I just wanted to add that into the conversation. Mm-hmm. Carolyn, why don't you ask your question? Go ahead, Carolyn. Catherine, are you, um, meant, are you referring to the one in the chat? Yes, I am. Mm-hmm. Well, no, I, I think this has just been great. And I'm just wondering from Nikki, um, can you also point to what action steps you think are really important? Yes, thank you. I mean, I think that everything that Heather and Mary uh, and others are bringing up are important because ultimately uh, changing the makeup of the legislature is what's going to come down to it. But I think Talking about abortion as healthcare, um, destigmatizing it and bringing it into the mainstream. I think we didn't do a great job of that between 1973 and now because people almost didn't want to draw attention because then maybe this would have happened sooner. Um, but now uh, we're bringing healthcare providers together to talk about abortion as healthcare and not wanting legislative interference. We had an open letter to the Tennessee General Assembly that in a week was signed by 700 healthcare providers and is continuing to uh, garner signatures and support Um, and just getting people on board and not say whispering and and not being afraid to talk about abortion as healthcare and access to abortion as a right and a freedom. And we do not want everything that, you know, Patty and Martha and Heather have said that all of the other rights that we know from uh, Justice Thomas's um, uh, writing of his decision that he thinks they're all lumped together and he thinks they all could be next. And if we want to keep all of those rights, we need to keep talking about it and keep drawing the message back. Heather is a master at, you know, her at her M's and things that are uh, triggers and just over and over saying that this is about freedom and bringing the message back when you talk to people, even if you can acknowledge that abortion is a complicated issue and you can acknowledge that not everybody thinks that abortion should be accessible in all situations. You bring it back to 
the idea that it is a personal healthcare decision and you bring it back to, you don't know what you would do until you were in that situation and you don't want to take that right away from anybody. Um, and you bring it back to the situations that are um, more in agreement with that uh, 60 to 80 percent of the population. People, people don't want abortion restricted when it is a healthcare yeah, mother. People don't want it restricted in rape and incest. People don't want to make people carry complicated fetal anomalies. So, I mean, while I think that I don't want to make it too medical, so just make it about no one knows what they would do until they're in that situation and respect that it is complicated and respect that some people do have deep-seated religious beliefs that life begins at fertilization. But also, that's not everybody's belief. And why should one person's belief dictate another? There are two lawsuits on, on religious freedom grounds, one yes, by a set of uh, Jewish congregation in Florida against DeSantis saying, you're imposing your religion on me. In fact, part of Judaism says that if the life of the mother is at stake, it is required to provide an abortion. That's right. I'd like to call on Nancy Myers, who's had her hand up for quite a while. I'm very new to the this group, although age-wise, I fit right in. Um, okay. And I have a daughter who's in her 50s who's now very active on this issue as, as well. I do think several things. What I've been doing is trying to reach out, particularly to younger people, how important it is to vote and if you're only going to vote in one election, vote in the primary. I'm tired of hearing people saying that they're not going to vote in the general election because they don't like their choices. But when you tell them that the primaries decide who the choices are going to be, it's like something they never thought about. So I think there's a lot of education on a lot of different pieces. And I think we do better by um, talking about all of the rights. And I, th I think the rights that we could be uh, losing, I, I am so sick and tired of hearing Senator Rubio's ads where he discusses how dare they turn boys into girls mm. that we are dealing with so many dog whistles on so many things that what our generation is leaving our grandchildren's generation with right now is such a mess. And it's very depressing for those of us who've worked on different pieces of this uh, to have all this taken away. But without the numbers voting, we can't change anything. And <clears throat> my push these days is to vote in the primary. Well, we've already missed the primary, so now you got to get them to vote. But no, I think no, it's I... emphasizing the midterms because people typically don't vote in midterms. They don't think they're important unless you're voting for a president, which obviously isn't true. And then emphasizing how important local elections are. Mm -hmm. I mean, nothing is more clear now than the Supreme Court throwing everything back to the state, although we know that's a dog whistle in itself. But the idea that they're saying everything is back to the state level. So you have to vote for your state representatives. And I would venture to say a lot of people don't even know who those people are or what districts they're in. That is absolutely correct. And now it is true that the primaries are over, but you have to tell people that if you don't vote, you can't complain. And if you missed out on the primary, you will have chances down the road. But here we are today, and so we have to take care of it. what you can do today, which is to make sure that you vote so that down the road and then pass that message on to others. Thank you. Nancy. Completely agree with what Nancy said. And I also really liked how she tied in 
how this issue, which others have also said, how this issue ties to other issues. I particularly, we are finding that the word freedom, more even than rights, more than democracy, freedom is the a galvanizing word that people respond to. And I, before we end, I wanted to particularly thank um, Nikki, because she is the next generation who is carrying on this fight. We are women over 70. It is fabulous that we still have the experience we have. For those of us who have the energy, we can connect, we can share the information, but it's the next generation that will carry this on. And Nikki, I was, I think we all were so impressed by your energy, your insight, your knowledge, and your deep commitment. I wanted to thank my incredibly dear friend, Pat Novick. We have been <laughs> friends for, I don't know, over 50 years. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and, and Martha, you really are a legend within this movement. Yes. Um, yes. And yes. we appreciate not, not I'm to make rolling it, my eyes. Well, we, anyway, I'm so glad to be your partner in this effort. And for all of you, for Gail and Catherine, thank you for hosting this effort. Thank you for inviting us into it. Um, the struggle continues. And when we organize, we'll change the